Today, we return to the subject of relating God's Word to His world. The subject that we began to address with a number of concrete illustrations in the last Ask the Rabbis session, and we continue on that score today, focusing in particular on broadly two issues, two issues that are somewhat contentious, but important issues to discuss, in which we need to seek guidance in God's Word in the Bible, for His world, for our lives, for what to do in this world. And so without any further ado, let's focus on the first of these questions. The first of these questions takes off where the last session ended, which was also with respect to considering the role of women. And here in particular, the questions pertain very directly to practices that are very well entrenched, especially among religious Jews, seeking a biblical basis, seeking an understanding. Also on the subject of women, if men and women are created to be partners, why is there so much separation between them among religious Jews? In particular, why do men and women not sit together in traditional synagogues? This has, since the traditional separation of men and women in the synagogues, was violated in particular in the United States over the course of the last roughly century and a half become increasingly a barb against traditional Jewish practice. And inevitably the question arises, we do believe that men and women are created to be partners. So why then the separation? Now the first observation that I have to make in this regard is a general one. I think we've already noted this in various ways in the past as well, and that is the importance of historical precedent in our traditions. Now when I speak of the importance of historical precedent, on the one hand, this could be seen as, and maybe in some ways is, a reflection of our being old-fashioned. And yet at the same time, I feel compelled to stress that maybe that being old-fashioned, that reverence of historical precedent is an inevitable consequence of bearing God's word, God's will throughout the generations. You don't make changes in the way you apply God's word, unless you're absolutely certain. And of course, inevitably, you don't necessarily change to accommodate the various winds of social change just because what you're doing doesn't appear to be in style. Now, having said that, there is arguably no domain in which historical precedent is more sacred, more inviolable than in the construction of the Holy Temple. The Holy Temple was built first as the temple in Jerusalem designed by King David, executed by King Solomon, and of course accompanied by the prophets of the time, chief among them, Nathan, Nathan, the prophet. And likewise, the second temple. The second temple after the return from the Babylonian exile. We read explicitly in the Bible. The last of the prophets in the Hebrew Bible, Haggai, 
Zechariah and Malachi were prophets in the second temple. The second temple was built under their guidance. So we're speaking of construction projects, both the first and the second, that were guided by prophets. In the first temple, by solemn tradition, and in the second temple, by inescapable historical corroboration, men and women were never together. There was a separate court for men and a separate court for women. They were separated at all times. Granted, this refers, of course, to the Holy Temple. Inevitably, we need to consider the extent to which it applies on an ongoing basis to us. Well, the first point that I'll stress in this regard is a verse that appears actually identically twice in Leviticus in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 30, and chapter 26, verse 2. You shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence, revere my sanctuary. I am God. And that becomes the central theme of the way we relate to the Holy Temple. Reverence. No levity, no lightheadedness, no frivolity. Not and all in the family experience, but rather one of revering. And as for its application to synagogues, in Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 16, God presents through the prophet words that are at least to a degree of consolation. Therefore, say, thus says God the Lord, although I have cast them far off among the nations, and although I have scattered them among the countries, and I have been to them a little sanctuary, in the Hebrew, mikdash necht, a miniature of the mikdash of the holy temple, in the countries where they have come. Well, of course, the prophet is speaking of God being that miniature sanctuary. But how in practice are we to connect with God as the miniature sanctuary? Do it. By constructing the miniature sanctuaries, synagogues, that have accompanied us throughout our wanderings in exile. Now, again, to that extent, we can appreciate how the separation of men and women in the first temple and in the second temple informs the construction of synagogues to this day. But to seek more specific guidance regarding separation of men and women in the Bible, we need to look further. And as we do, I feel inevitably compelled to make an observation that I've noted in the past, and that is our seeking guidance in God's Word, in the Bible, is something that we do in everything in our lives. For Israel, we regard that guidance as not merely a good idea, but as an obligation. The words of the Bible were intended at the outset to obligate Israel, in particular, of course, the words of the Torah, the five books of Moses. With respect to all the rest of the world, as we've noted on many occasions, we don't regard the words of the Torah that were directed specifically at Israel as binding, as obligating, but of course, simultaneously, we do appreciate everyone regards the Bible as God's will and God's word revealed, inevitably strives to integrate some lessons, some messages from them. What lessons? What messages? Well, again, for Israel, 
we believe it's an obligation. For everyone else, I suppose it's going to be an ongoing challenge to determine exactly how to integrate these messages into our lives. More on that a little bit later. But in the meantime, let's consider as arguably the first place where this becomes a central aspect of the manner in which we relate to our service of God, what takes place at Sinai? At Sinai, of course, the foremost revelation of God to the world. In Exodus chapter 19, verse 15. After Moses descends the mountain to the people, sanctifying the people, they wash their clothes, he said to the people, be ready by the third day, the day of the revelation. And how is that readiness to be manifest? Come not near any woman. That, of course, includes your wives. Now, we should stress that this is a prohibition specifically imposed upon the men. And as is often the case in this regard, there is, I suppose we need to concede, a thinly veiled put down of men with respect to women. That is, the women would be able to attain that level of sanctity, that level of holiness, without being told without the prohibition. The men need to be told. The men need to be forbidden to come near the women. But again, the bottom line is that at Sinai, when God revealed his will and his word to Israel, the men and the women were separate. While we can well imagine experiencing direct divine revelation is pretty much a guarantee as a recipe for avoiding any kind of lightheadedness, still and all, to properly accept God's revelation, the men and the women were not together. To consider one additional example, in a way, at the opposite pole of history, in Zechariah chapter 12, where we read about the bitter mourning that takes place in the future on the brink of redemption. The circumstances of this mourning we discussed in question and answer session 10 just about a year ago, pertaining to what exactly is meant by the cryptic words of the prophet in Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. But what we read in the verses that follow, from 11 through 14, through the end of the chapter, on that day shall there be a great mourning in Jerusalem, like the mourning of Adad-Limon in the valley of Megiddon, and the land shall mourn. Pay attention. Every family apart, the family of the house of David apart, and their wives apart. The family of the house of Nathan apart, and their wives apart. The family of the house of Levi apart, and their wives apart. The family of Shimei apart, and their wives apart. All the families that remain, every family apart, and their wives apart. And of course, inevitably, once again, the message is, if this is in a state of warning, it certainly is not a circumstance that would occasion frivolity or lightheadedness. And yet, the men and the women are apart from one another. And I can't help but note, but that these verses are presented in our tradition as the inspiration 
for ensuring the separation of men and women in the Holy Temple as well. So, by way of the establishment of historical precedent, it should be clear that the Bible presents a clear, a very strident message of separation of men and women. And historically, we should note, this became, even the ancient world, the signal of a synagogue as opposed to the houses of worship of other nations. I feel compelled, admittedly, on something of an exceptional basis here, to share with you the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 34 and 35, which represent, evidently, a rebuke of what was taking place among the Corinthians. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak. But they are commanded to be under obedience, as also says the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. Admittedly, what evidently Paul was contending with, with the Corinthians, was pagan influences that militated heavily against the separation of men and women that he knew very well from the synagogue. And, well, you well know. I think far better than I, of the tug of war that was taking place between the Jewish influences that Paul here is championing and the pagan influences that were pulling in a very different direction. Corinth, in particular, was fairly renowned for its less than prudish level of morality. Without elaborating further, we can well appreciate in that regard just what Paul means. Again, I'm not focusing on this. I do feel it's important for us to bear it in mind. But I think we have fairly well established the historical precedent that to us as traditional Jews is indeed so sacred. What we haven't addressed yet at this point is why this should be the case. I feel compelled to share with you a slogan that was very much championed, in particular in the mid-20th century in the United States, among those groups that sought to undermine the traditional synagogue, the family that prays together stays together. Now, we are all for families staying together. We don't, however, regard praying together as the recipe for doing that. And while we discussed prayer in other contexts and at fairly great length, i just like, for the purposes of our discussion at present, to share with you three very brief excerpts from Psalms. The first, from Psalm 16, verse 8. I have set God always before me. Surely he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Feel the sense here of what the psalmist is conveying with respect to what prayer means. God is right in front of me, and I am communing directly with him. And in a similar vein, perhaps, arguably, even stronger. In the Song of Ascent, Psalm 123, verse 2, Behold, as the eyes of servants look to the hand of their masters, and as the eyes of a maid to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes wait upon God our Lord until he shall be gracious to us. Now besides the obvious in context, which is, you know, the male servants and the maid servants 
aren't together. They are described separately. Besides that, consider the imagery, the servant standing in front of his or her master. Being in a direct communion with God, when you're in a direct communion with God, no one else makes a difference. You don't feel that camaraderie with everyone. You don't seek the security of the family. Rather, on the contrary, you seek to commune directly in an unmediated fashion with God. And finally, the opening verse of the Song of Ascent, Psalm 130, out of the depths I have cried to you, O God, out of the depths. Again, no security, no safety net, no family support system. To truly, sincerely feel that you are standing alone with God. Now, I feel compelled to add here a kind of ironical note, and arguably it's even a tension. And that is that, as a rule, we Jews place a tremendous emphasis upon not praying in solitude. This is an idea that is derived, associated with the words of Leviticus chapter 22, verse 32. You shall not profane my holy name, but I will be hallowed, sanctified, among the children of Israel, in the assembly, in the congregation. And indeed, there are components of the Jewish prayer service that can only be said when we are in the company of that minimum quorum, that minimum size assembly in standing before God. So, on the one hand, there is the realization that we do need a community. And I feel for Jews, it is much more axiomatic that a religious Jew needs to strive to be part of a community than is often the case among many Christians. One of the things that I must concede, I feel very much driven to stress, is that Christians need to be part of church. They shouldn't separate themselves. They shouldn't simply be all alone. Because manifestly, God is intent upon establishing a covenantal community. And indeed, in this regard, we sense relentlessly in Scripture that God isn't only orienting himself with respect to the salvation of the individual, but rather with respect to the salvation of the world. And therefore, the community plays a critical role. So we aren't trivializing that at all. And yet, here's the irony, the tension. On the one hand, God is sanctified in the assembly. So we're present in the company of others. And yet, on the other hand, in the company of others, each of us, is all alone, approaching God on an unmediated level without anything, anyone in the middle. The way we speak to God in our prayers relentlessly is direct, second person, you, Baruch Ata, you are blessed. Everything is directly between us and God. Anyone else would only be a distraction, even though there are others. But that inevitably also informs the emphasis that we find in our tradition going back to Sinai, manifest in the temples, and even in the world of redemption of the future, that men and women commune individually with God and separately. So, to that extent then, 
this is certainly the core, from my perspective, of addressing the question of how we sit in traditional synagogues, but there's an additional dimension that I also feel compelled to share with you. And maybe the best way of introducing this additional dimension is to recall an experience of mine when I was, I guess, a young, impetuous student in university. And in one of my philosophy courses, we were discussing John Stuart Mill's on the subjugation of women. And I can vividly recall the professor posing to the class. And I guess I should add also here that at the time, Columbia College and Columbia University was all male. So it was a class exclusively of men. Did we feel that women were subject to any kind of subjugation? And being young and impetuous, I raised my hand and I said, well, I can't speak for any of you, but as a religious Jew, I can emphatically state that in the traditional Jewish community, women are not subjugated. You can well imagine pandemonium broke loose. I was the only religious Jew in the class. Actually, I think I was the only religious anything in the class. And while many of the students had all sorts of objections based upon the stereotype images they had of Jews, there was one critical point that I felt compelled to make that really did give them all pause. I said, you're evaluating Judaism from the perspective of your Christian heritage in which the center of your religion is the church. The center of Judaism is not the synagogue. Because after all, what is the core of Judaism? What defines being a faithful Jew is observance of the precepts that God gave us in the Torah, in the five books of Moses, integrating them on every level in our lives. Torah, as we've noted on many occasions, teaching, teaching us how to live. Well, where do we do most of our living? We do most of our living at home. The home is the center of Judaism, not the synagogue. Men and women are indeed separate in the synagogue. And we'll even admit, you can't help admitting it, that in the synagogue, the more dominant role is played by men. Maybe we wouldn't express ourselves quite as sternly as Paul did, but the basic idea is certainly a valid one. In the home, it is the woman's role that is decisive. All of the major domains of Jewish living are first and foremost the domains of the Jewish woman. And so, while indeed we will stress that we don't sit together in traditional synagogues, it certainly shouldn't be taken as implying any lesser status to women. We admit, as we noted last time as well, men and women have different roles to play. This is an instance in which separate but equal is equal. Because men and women are different. So why would we expect them to have the same role? So this, of course, then is an additional dimension that I certainly feel compelled to share with you. It inevitably pertains likewise to one additional verse in Scripture, also from Psalms, that I think is critical for us to appreciate and bear in mind here. And that is Psalm 45, verse 14. The king's daughter is all glorious within. Now, in our tradition, this doesn't only apply to king's daughters. The king's daughter 
is a paradigm for all women, all glorious within. The distinction then drawn between the outward-facing role and the inward-facing role. The synagogue is the outward-facing role. That is indeed a central aspect of Judaism, but while central, it's still secondary. In the home, the king's daughter is all glorious within. And that glory focuses inwardly and informs our appreciation of just how central the role of the woman is in the family serving God in all of us coming to God. I think for the purposes of our discussion at present, we'll move on for now to the next question. There is inevitably so much that can be said about each of these points that our time is limited. So especially after having made the general observation about not sitting together, but still and all being equal, and why do men and women not even shake hands with one another? And I admit this is an important point to discuss because we are aware of other cultures in which you get the impression that men are shunning the women and treating the women as inferiors, denigrating the women. I think it's important for us to appreciate that the practice, that it's true, that men and women don't even shake hands with one another, if anything, is a little bit denigrating to the men. But in order to understand why, we'll need to consider an essential core message that emerges in a couple of other passages in the Bible. I'd like to begin with Numbers chapter 6. In Numbers chapter 6, we read about the Nazarite. The Nazarite, an individual who strives to attain an exceptional level of sanctity in his life, and one of the expressions of that sanctity is to avoid any kind of intoxication. And since there is that avoidance of intoxication, obviously, the Nazarite doesn't drink wine. But that's not all. The Nazarite doesn't consume. In Numbers chapter 6, in verses 3 and 4, we read, She shall abstain from wine and strong drink, and shall drink no vinegar of wine or vinegar of strong drink. Vinegar? Vinegar isn't intoxicating. You can't get drunk on vinegar. It doesn't have any alcohol in it. No. Not vinegar of wine nor of strong drink. Nor shall I drink any liquor of grapes, nor eat moist grapes or dried. The fruit, the fruit as grapes or even as raisins, the Nazarite is forbidden to eat. Not only that, in verse 4, all the days of his abstinence shall he eat nothing that is made of the vine, from the kernels even to the husk, grape pits. You certainly can't get drunk on them, can you? So why in the world does God forbid the Nazarite from drinking vinegar, eating grape pits, is obviously a crucial message to be gleaned from this. And the message, maybe to express it in the broadest of terms, is a message about how you relate to something that's really, really precious to you. In the case of the Nazarite, in as much as the Torah is prescribing a formula for more exalted, more holy living. If it's really important to you, anything really precious, you make a fence around it. You ensure that you'll never even come close 
to trespassing, to overstepping the bounds. If you have something that is extraordinarily fragile and extraordinarily valuable, you don't even come close. And so, God guides us in the case of the Nazarite to establishing not only the parameters of what makes sense to us as the law, but the sense for the law. To cite one additional example, and inevitably, in this additional example, there's something of an ambiguity with respect to the literal meaning of the text and the figurative meaning of the text in Proverbs chapter 5, which begins with an involved description of the strange woman attempting to seduce her prey. The warning as expressed in verse 8 is distance your way far from her. Don't even go near. Don't put yourself in a position that could be morally compromising. Obviously, this can apply to far, far more domains in life than the literal seductive woman. It could also apply to being seduced by all sorts of ideas that can be dangerous and ultimately destructive. And undoubtedly, it is with respect to all of those ideas that Proverbs warns us not just to keep away, to keep far away. Another way of saying, make a fence. If your moral integrity is as precious to you as it should be, you should make sure to not even come close to compromising it. Now, with all that as background, we turn to Leviticus chapter 18. Leviticus chapter 18 lists a great many sexual relationships that God has forbidden. I'll note that in this list of forbidden sexual relationships, there are those that we regard as binding to all of humanity, included in the prohibition on illicit sexual relationships that, you may recall, is one of the prohibitions of the Noahide laws. And there are also prohibitions here that apply exclusively as an obligation upon Israel and don't obligate the rest of the world. In either case, the underlying principle, as we've discussed in the past, is the sexual script strictures that are imposed in the Bible are intended to sanctify us. They are intended to sanctify us because, to be very blunt, sex is one domain in which functionally, physically, human beings can be like animals. The sex drive is one that animates animals, and let's be honest, it animates human beings as well. And it is possible through our sexuality to indeed debase ourselves, to become like animals. The forbidden sexual relationships impose upon us, even before we speak of sanctity, a level of humanity. A human being can discern, differentiate, separate oneself, saying this is permitted and this is forbidden is the hallmark of being able to infuse sanctity into our lives. Hence, the sexual prohibitions that are legislated by God in the Bible, in particular, again, in this chapter, in Leviticus chapter 18 and again in Leviticus chapter 20, and elsewhere, but those are the principal sections that emphasize these laws. 
for the most part, the laws are expressed as specific prohibitions, sexual relationships in which one is forbidden to engage. But there's one in which we find an additional dimension that is particularly striking, and that is what we read in verse 19. Now I'm going to read verse 19 in a more literal translation than I suspect some of the translations may offer because, as always, we see God in the details. The verse states, to a woman in the defilement of her menstrual flow, you shall not approach. You shall not draw near to uncover her nakedness. And of course, the obvious, God could have said, don't uncover her nakedness. If you look at the surrounding verses, there's a long sequence of prohibitions that came before this verse that are indeed expressed precisely that way, to not uncover the nakedness, referring to a prohibited sexual relationship. But here there's the additional dimension, and it is glaring. Don't come close. Don't draw near. Why not? So long as I avoid the forbidden act, why shouldn't I? Remember the lesson of the Nazarite. Remember the lesson of Proverbs chapter 5. The lesson is, if something is really precious to you, and in this case we're talking about your moral integrity, don't even come close to compromising it. Something that's truly valuable. You don't allow yourself to even come close to violate it. And so, this additional prohibition, don't even come close. Now, of course, I feel compelled to stress here as well, as we did at Sinai a few moments ago, that the prohibition is particularly expressed as a prohibition on the man. The implication being that women are far, far less prone than men to compromise their moral integrity. It's the men who needed to be sternly warned, don't come close. And admittedly, it is a little bit denigrating to men, but let's face it, we have to be realistic. Men do have more of a tendency than women to behave in an animal-like fashion, and therefore, God's words are especially directed at the men. Don't come close. Now, this is part of the answer to the question about shaking hands, but not enough. Because I realize, of course, inevitably, the question that will arise is, what's the big deal about a handshake? It's not an expression of sexuality. It's simply a social courtesy. Whereupon, of course, inevitably, I need to concede, you're right. Shaking hands is just a social courtesy. And truth be told, if you ask me, is a handshake between a man and a woman, from the perspective of our tradition, a violation of biblical law as expressed in Leviticus chapter 18, verse 19? My answer is no, it's not. It's not. Because after all, the thrust of the verse is don't approach, don't come near to uncover her nakedness. If there isn't any affection expressed, if it isn't something that can lead to compromising one's moral integrity, then it is not a violation of biblical law. So what is it? What it is, from our perspective, in our tradition, is yet another example of our striving to go in God's footsteps, copying his example. 
by which I mean, well, again, what we saw with respect to the Nazarite was enshrined in biblical law. God saying, make a fence. And in Proverbs, Proverbs teaches us, stay away. Don't even come close. And again, in Leviticus chapter 18, verse 19, don't draw near. Don't approach. Well, if biblical law prohibits any commingling of the sexes that expresses affection and could lead directly to compromising one's moral integrity, then we, going in God's footsteps, following his example, make a sense too. And the sense that we make is avoiding any contact physically between men and women, even if it isn't one of affection, even if it is a social courtesy. If you ask, well, well, what happens if one party will feel insulted by the failure to extend this social courtesy? It's a good question. And many of us indeed have the practice in order to avoid causing any grief or anguish or a feeling of being offended to another to accept the hand extended regardless, as long as it's not actually expressive of affection, whereupon it really would be a violation of God's law. The social courtesy aspect isn't of that status, but it is something that we do try to avoid compromising where possible because of the sex. Because something that's really, really, really precious. Not only do we want to avoid violating, we want to avoid coming close to violating. So I hope that provides us with at least something of an insight into the handshake. And finally in this section, the third question. Also, why do religious Jewish women cover their hair with a hat or a headscarf or a wig after they are married? So inevitably here, as in the case of the previous questions, I feel compelled to give you on the one hand an explicit biblical answer, and on the other hand, to consider the conceptual ramifications. So, with respect to the biblical answer, we turn to Numbers chapter 5, verse 18. And I must concede, this isn't exactly the most pleasant subject to consider, but it's important for us to consider here. In Numbers chapter 5, we read of the woman who is suspected of infidelity, of having engaged in an adulterous relationship, whereupon her husband, together with her, come to the holy temple, and there is a procedure that is intended, actually miraculously, to testify as to whether she actually became defiled in an adulterous affair or not. What's relevant for our purposes, again in Numbers chapter 5, verse 18, is one stage in this procedure. And the priest shall set the woman before God and loosen, undo the hair of the woman's head. The derivation here is fairly straightforward. The Hebrew is ufara, which means to undo something that is bound, that is ordered to loosen. Obviously, that implies that her hair beforehand was bound together. This is not expressed anywhere in the Bible as a specific imperative. It is rather a given. 
that married women always kept their hair bound and covered. And in fact, it was considered a veritable disgrace for this woman's hair to be undone as part of this procedure, because after all, she is suspect of infidelity. So, again, on the level of a biblical source, this is our source. But inevitably, in our attempting to integrate this to understand what it means. I think, first of all, it's instructive for us to consider the role of covering the hair. You will undoubtedly recall that when Abraham's servant brings Rebecca back as Isaac's bride, we read on their return trip in Genesis chapter 24, verses 64 and 65, and Rebekah lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she descended from the camel. And she said to the servant, What man is this that walks in the field to meet us? And the servant said, It is my master. In other words, your intended husband. Therefore, she took her veil and covered herself. And indeed, to this day, an integral component of the traditional Jewish wedding ceremony is the bridegroom covering the bride's head in her veil on the way to the marriage canopy. But what's the idea? What theme does this invoke? I submit to you that the hair of the head is, after all, on some plane, what emanates from what we essentially are. The core of our being is in here. The hair of our head is what comes out from that. What we produce as an expression of what we keenly, truly are. To take another example, to illustrate essentially the same point, we return to Numbers chapter 6 and the story of the Nazarite, that in chapter 6, verse 5, we read, all the days of the vow of his separation, of his being a Nazarite, there shall no razor come on his head until the days are fulfilled during which he separates himself to God. He shall be holy and shall let the locks of hair of his head grow. To what end? To the end that is described in verse 18, that when the period of being a Nazarite concludes, the Nazarite shall shave the head of his separation at the door of the tent of meeting and shall take the hair of the head of his separation, that is, the hair of his head that was separated from the razor that was allowed to grow unimpeded and put it in the fire which is under the sacrifice of the peace offering. The Nazarite takes all the hair of his head and brings it, essentially, as an offering to God at the conclusion of his period of being a Nazarite. That is, the hair, again, signifies his identity as consecrated to God. Everything that his core being produces, all of it, is consecrated to God. And in the same vein, the Jewish woman entering into the bond of marriage consecrates everything that she is doing to the new home that she's establishing together with her husband. And of course, inevitably, remember once again the words of Psalm 45, verse 14, all the glory 
of the king's daughter is within. She is altogether glorious within. All of that, the glory that is her own, is within. It isn't revealed publicly. It is consecrated to the home that she and her husband are building together. So I think that is a critical aspect for us to consider in understanding what the significance of covering the hair is, even as it is inevitably critical for us to consider a more general lesson, which is altogether the lesson of modesty. The lesson of modesty that, again, we need to admit, is something of a put down to men. The implication that in the absence of the strictures of modesty, men are liable to make women into objects. We see this all too often in Western society. And I'm not saying this in any way to relieve men of the blame. The blame is unquestionably upon us, upon the men. It's a problem. It's a terrible problem. If we objectify other people because they are women. And so the strictures of the Torah with respect to the modesty of the women are intended to avoid that happening, to emphasize that both men and women engage in serving God on their own merits in terms of who they are, not through engendering any kind of an attitude, positive or negative, in members of the other sex. And so, the stress necessarily, relentlessly, is sanctifying the bond between the man and the woman. The married woman, then, consecrates her bond to her husband, consecrates her bond to her home, where, as we already noted, she reigns supreme. All the glory of the king's daughter, or alternatively, the king's daughter is all glorious with him. And so beyond the scriptural citation that provides the formal source, this gives us something of an idea of just what the various strictures that we find in our tradition based upon biblical law teach us with respect to relationships between men and women. Again, binding, obligating upon Israel, but with a message, with something to teach each and every one of us who believe in the Bible, who believe in it as God's word, with respect to how we should live our lives, and most of all, how we should sanctify our lives. On that note, we'll conclude this first section. We have so much more to talk about, but we'll leave it for another time.